So category number three is the outright destruction or fragmentation of one's contiguous landscapes or seascapes. And in general, uh, we could talk about just, you know, the plopping down or, or the construction of a bridge or some typical fragmentation, which again is going to go on all over the place. But we also have this particular concentration of coastal development that not only um, does the typical fragmentation or outright destruction that we might be uh, most familiar with, but also there's something in particular about the coastal zone, which is the fact that it's, a, it's essentially a two-dimensional feature, right? It's this, it's this coastline. And there are things, energy, materials, critters, that as we, as we uh, develop the coastal zone, it may not, be, may, may not fall into our wheelhouse, at least initially, of traditional fragmentation, but it's a huge issue. So the coyote can't get from the Santa Monica Mountains down to the beach and back up, right? The bird that would maybe want to nest in some vegetation, there's no vegetation, it's just sand and then road. That type of stuff um, is, is somewhat unique in the, and, and particularly pronounced in the coastal zone. So, okay, here we go. Habitat loss and degradation. Now, what, are people, what are people's attitudes about that? One minute, ready, set, go. Talk, talk amongst yourselves. It's getting worse, okay. All right. So what, what question, what exciting question did I find for this? Oh, look, wetland change over the last 150 years. So this is one of the few, so, so one of the challenges, one of the challenges we have with things like fisheries, so the fisheries gotten better or worse over 60 years, right? Uh, so people have an opinion, and then they turn to you, and then you turn to me and go, so, okay, they thought, they said X, what's the answer? And then I kind of go, well, it kind of depends on what you want to measure, right? So sometimes it's hard to, are we talking about, you know, uh, industrial pollutants? Are we talking about, you know, uh, surface water runoff? What? But in this case, the amount of wetland, we very to a high degree of specificity, we actually know this answer. So this one, we actually know what the real answer is. And so we ask people, how have, how have our coastal wetlands changed in California over the last 150 years, basically since we became a state? Since we became part of the US. And the answer is, uh, most people think that our wetland extent has decreased. Very few people think there was no change. Very few people think that the extent of wetlands, aerial extent has increased or expanded. And then again, uh, unsure is, a, is a, a high proportion. But in this case, unsure did not win. The largest group says uh, wetlands have decreased. And that is correct. So any guesses as to what proportion of our wetlands have gone away? What's that? 80% higher. 90% higher. 96, 94, too high. 93, too high. 91 is the winner. Ding, 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 ding. Go to Morongo. 91% of our wetlands. We lead the US in the proportion of, that's a great question for a quiz. We lead the US in the proportion of wetland acreage lost. Louisiana leads the US in the gross quantity of wetlands lost. California leads in terms of pro the proportional loss, what we had versus what we have now. It's primarily because of the biggest impacts um, were, uh, yeah, outright destruction from filling um, World War II around that era, but uh, one of the biggest jump starts was the gold rush that filled in a vast swath of San Francisco Bay. So people seem to get, at least with wetlands, that that wetland loss has been a, a fairly that, that we've that we've lost this this one category of of land cover. 
Okay, introduce species. Introduce species. So what's the question? Well, it's kind of, it's not a great question. But I'm just going to tell you. I want you to talk about it for a minute and tell me what you think about people's attitudes towards invasive species. All right, let's find out. Or they unsure? Okay, now don't get angry with me. I had to reach to find a question that talked about invasive species. Yeah, okay. Stop! Don't get angry. Okay, so. Now, every other year, breathe, breathe everybody. Every other year, we do um, a series of questions about specific management actions. And so those questions, which you guys don't have that longer version of the survey, those questions are, are done in, in a, in a one-page uh, thing where they, they mark some stuff. So what they, how they do that question, again, what you guys haven't seen that, that version, that, that subset of question, they rank from very positive, which gets a plus two, to very negative, which gets a minus two. So if they're neutral on this, on this management decision, we ask about a bunch of things. It's a zero, right. And so one of the questions was, how do you feel about the removal of non-native feral animals on the California Channel Islands? This would be our goat, our, no, not our foxes, not removing the foxes, to help the foxes. So this would be removing the pigs. Yeah, right, all those non-native rats, all those non-native critters. So uh, again, we'll talk about this later, but, but uh, now, because this question, we, had, we didn't have a whole lot of people in class last year, so we kind of split up. So notice this is a relatively small sample size, only five, still a good sample size, but compared to, for us, 500 is a relatively small sample size for us. And so the score for if people thought it was positive or negative, people were, were, were fairly positive on it. So it had a, an average score of 0.88. The variance means that it's not necessarily statistically different from zero, but the way we do this, we compare it to other stuff. When you compare it to other, oh, I should also say 34% of the people were unsure. Those 34% don't factor into the score. The score is only for people that express an opinion as to whether it was good, neutral, bad. And so the, the most positive thing, at least last year, the most positive thing that people liked was the creation of the network of, of marine protected areas, which we will talk about, uh, in, across California. So that was the most happy, uh, the, the most, the best management thing we did of the, of the various things we asked about last year. The least popular, which is always the least popular every year we ask this, or at least since 2012, was the closures of the California State Parks in 2012 because of our budget. We had to shut, if you guys remember, we had to shut down all the parks and people, you could not go to your public spaces. People really didn't care for that. So, so it gives you a sense as to where this falls. This, this is fairly positive. This is, this is pretty positive on the scale of these things. So people yeah. seem to like getting rid of the non-native species, at least in sort of the abstract, a place where they don't go, they don't have to see and think about it, right? That, that's the best I could come up with for a specific question, specifically asking about one particular invasive species. Okay, last one, institutional effectiveness. So. Uh, before we, you guys talk about it, I'll just say that this has, this has a couple flavors. One is just the obvious one, which is the overlapping uses. The fisherman wants to use the port. Uh, the, the shipping guy wants to use the port. The recreational fisherman wants to go out on the jetty, right? So we have that, the, the spatial autocorrelation, the spatial overlap of everybody that, because we're so concentrated in the coastal zone oftentimes, Everybody's on top of everybody. And everybody wants their, to do their activity in the same physical place. So that in and of itself creates challenges. How do we decide who wins, who loses, who gets to do what on what day, what have you? But also, so that, that's like the, the most basic level. But then really, and the, the key part of this is tied up with that, is oftentimes very or potentially very different opinions of what we should be doing in the coastal zone. So really different fundamental motivations um, that people are bringing when they come to the coastal zone in the first place. Okay, so talk amongst yourself. Do you think people think we're doing a good job with these sort of conflicting management, with our management in the coastal zone? What do, you, what, do, what do people think? Go, discuss. Drum roll. Oh, it's a very exciting drum roll. Okay, here's 
two, two, uh, two ways of asking this. One is, um, in terms of our coastal governing, wait, did I show you this one? No, I didn't. Okay, good. Okay, so our coastal governing, are we doing too much, or should we do more, or are we unsure? 55%, and again, this is uh, of 1,200 people, 55% felt we should do more. So even more than unsure, again, this is getting back to that more generic level, right? We're not asking about a specific management action. We're asking about the big picture. In the big picture, people want us to be more aggressive. And, um, and, and followed by people, well, I'm not sure we should do. And so the minority is the people that think we're doing too much. We're being too aggressive, too many rules, as it were. Okay. And then if we ask in aggregate, so, so that, that, that's you know, our, our style of governing, our style of maybe coming together and, and dealing in, in these, this complicated trade-off type of area. Uh, and more simpler, are we, are we doing a good job of managing our, our coastline, our California coast? People don't think, uh, well, and unsure is the winner here. But overall, fairly, fairly close. Uh, not, not as disparate as some of our other things. So unsure. So only a quarter of people, I'll say it this way, only a quarter of people definitely think we're doing a good job of managing the coast. OK. That's, those are individual stressors. The next thing we can talk about is how these individual stressors come together. General term for that is synergism or synergistic interactions. So um, I'll explain this to you, but first I want, again, you guys are working on trying to interpret stuff. So I want you guys to stare at this for a minute or two, and then I'm gonna ask you what you think's going on. Let me just say that this is, an ex this is a, from a paper this year, this is um, uh, looking at coastal wetlands, coastal salt marshes in New England and looking at the effect, the brown color here is uh, what happens to the extent of salt marsh, the, the aerial extent, the two-dimensional extent, uh, when we uh, raise the sea level, when we have more water there than we otherwise would, or excuse me, uh, water uh, on the surface for longer than we, we otherwise would. And then the purple treatment here represents uh, more crabs. And these crabs uh, will eat little teeny pieces of the vegetation and, and have a grazing effect, OK? So, so with that preparation, I'm going to give you guys a minute or two, stare at this, and see if you can interpret what's going on. If these factors acted totally independently, we should be able to add them together, right? So it would be like me punching you, right? I, get, I punch you twice, boom, boom, and you get a bruise. And I punch you twice, boom, boom, and you get a bruise. So you might say, oh, if I punch you four times, you'll get you know, twice as big a bruise. right? That would be additive. Or maybe I punch you, boom, boom, two times, and then punch you, boom, boom, two times, and your jaw is broken. Right? You guys get me? And so, that's, and so, so the additive is the prediction. If in doing these individual things, these, these are independent and they're, they're merely additive, that's the best situation because then we can have a really great model. We can understand with doing a little bit of work, we can have a really excellent predictive power for seeing what's going to happen to our system. Unfortunately, reality, nature doesn't work, isn't that uh, simple oftentimes. And so with, when these guys did these actual experiments, they found the result on the right. <clears throat> if if the result was just the 27 percent, that would just be add. That would just be so-called additive. If instead, see, I see this one arrow is going down. If if we found uh, a loss of wetland less than 27 percent, we would say that there was some antagonism going on. That something about the dynamics of the system made it less bad. So by the two things happening together, it was actually good for the system, right? They somehow attacked each other. You can imagine maybe, this, maybe it was two disease organisms and they had, you know, a bacterium attack another bacterium or something like that. 
In fact, what they found in this case was the opposite. Not that they had, had less bad, it had more bad and way more bad. So we had 86% loss of our salt marsh when these two things happen together, as they will in the real world, right? So again, our factors are, are uh, more inundation because the sea level on average is getting a little higher, and then um, uh, more, uh, some additional crabs. So eat more crabs. <laughs> so eat more crabs, right. <laughs> more, more, uh, more seafood pasta. So can you guys think of a possible mechanism? How, what, what, how could that, uh, what might be the mechanism for that? Um, so you're on the right track. Although it's not a tiny little bit, it's that, it's that the sea level rise pushes them farther up onto the marsh plain. Mm -hmm. And the marsh plain isn't like a, isn't, isn't a uh, up down, it's not a, it's not a 45 degree thing, right? It's really a flat area. And so, so when the sea level rise gets to a certain height, because these crabs, if they're out in the air, they don't do so well, right? They need to be a little bit wet. They need to be a little bit aquatic, right? A little bit, a little bit um, having their gills moist. And so the, the explanation that the authors propose is that, oh my gosh, the sea level goes up and all of a sudden it now, has, it now offers the crabs, the grazers, access to the whole marsh plain in, in a very short period of time, right? In other words, it's not a linear additional thing. If we added a millimeter, they have a little bit more space. But once you cross that threshold, again, we talked about that, right? The threshold responses, the whole system can, in theory, collapse. So that's an example of synergism, okay? That's one example. Everybody with me on that? Make sense? Okay, so let's look at another example. So in this case, this one is looking at uh, invertebrates, little critters, little, little guys swimming around the water column. And uh, in this case, this was uh, in a different part of the world. It's over in the Baltic. And so what these guys were looking at was the effect of uh, temperature, sea, excuse me, um, uh, sea temperatures, water temperature, and this particular compound, which is a type of flame retardant. In this part of the world, we have a lot of uh, to legacy of, of uh, industrial, um, you know, former Soviet Union legacy industrial pollution. So they were looking at this particular compound, which is again used as as uh, as a way to suppress flames in, in certain materials. So these guys did this experiment, and they ran it over time. So here you see this is so on just to orient you on this on the bottom down here. Here's time one. Uh, this is time six. So this is you know several days later. This is time thirteen. So almost two weeks after this uh, guy. So we're going through time. The colors here represent the different treatments. So the red represent the regular temperature right now. I probably should have made a different color. That wasn't, that wasn't the best choice. Of, so the, <laughs> so the uh, and, then, and then elevated temperature is blue because I'm so smart, I made it blue um, for the warmer water. And then it either is, it either is as it is now without the, or, or let's say in the control condition, without the pollutant or with the pollutant. So the solid shows where we had the pollutant, the hatched shows where we didn't have the pollutant. Everybody, everybody with me? And the, I know we haven't talked about these yet, but basically these are different groups of invertebrates. So this is, these are rotifers, these are little baby uh, mussels and things like that. Uh, this, is, this is a snake, these are baby snails. And these are baby crustaceans. So these are all larvae. These four up here, and then these are um, some of these same copepods. These are these are just adults. So these are the, the genera of these guys. Okay, so we, you essentially think of them as four as four different critters, and and the met, the axes here is just go, they go from they're obviously different individuals. So there's they're different concentrations, but they all go from relatively low to relatively high abundance. Cool. So why don't you guys stare at that and see if you can uh, tell me what's going on here. Right. Right. So firstly, this is, this is a, a, what we might call a mesocosm. This is, this is a, a small community, right? And so um, we have different things going on. So there's probably going to be some winners. There's probably going to be some losers. You guys with me? 
Okay. So let's take the example. Let's take the example of the bivalves, right? So when we start the treatment, there's basically the bivalves aren't doing too well, right? Not many of them. They obviously take a while to mature, but but they seem to do well when the rotifers aren't very abundant, when the gastropods aren't very abundant. Yeah, with me. So they 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 reach their highest uh, um, later on. They also, in the case of the bivalves, they reach their highest where it's the warmest and where it's the most pollution. So that seems to suggest that maybe the bivalves have some kind, some ability to to tolerate hot and to tolerate, uh, uh, yeah, the pollution. What about what about the gastropods? How the gastropods handle that stuff? They do good. Do they do they do good? Initially, initially, then they die off, right? How about, how about the copepods? How do the copepods handle this? They don't like the pollution. Yeah, right. So in other words, what we're seeing is it's it, there, there's some level of different sensitivity to these different factors. So in other words, it's, it's probably not going to be the case that all of our critters are going to respond similarly to all the others. Even though in this case, these guys are all phytoplankton, they're all floating around in the water column. So, you know, in theory, they're kind of sort of doing the same thing, sort of eating the same food and stuff. But clearly, there's, there's very different responses based on the, um, on, on the critter. Indeed, look at these guys. These are, these are, two, crusta these are two copepod crustaceans, right? So big picture, kind of sort of similar. Think of like a deer and, I don't know, a moose or a deer and a horse or something like that, right? But check it out. Um, this guy, the guy on the left, um, when there's no pollution, no uh, um, regular water temperature, they seem to rock. When they start the experiment, these guys are like, woo, super abundant. They, they tank, right? Let's, let's follow these, this hatched condition. They don't do well over time in any event, in a, in a, excuse me, in a normal event. But when we start messing with these things, when we start, uh, in this case, adding the pollut pollutant, they seem to do better over time. So some individuals are going to, there's always going to be winners and losers in, say, the issue of climate change and the, and the issue of should we put this pier in. There's going to be some guys that win, some guys that lose. And you can't tell who's going to win just from doing the single individual experiments, the single factor uh, manipulations. Right? We need to do them in concert with these other factors that are varying simultaneously. Fact, so-called factorial design experiments. Okay? You guys seem super excited about this. I can tell you just like this is lifting your afternoon up and you're like, yeah, synergy. Okay. <laughs> The other, the, the last broad topic about these, uh, or last broad thing to touch on in terms of these challenges and these stressors is this notion of conflicting priorities. So this can come about because, well, this primarily comes about because again, we're all on top of each other in the immediate coastal zone. Everybody wants to have their surf shop on the beach Everybody wants to have their restaurant on the beach. Everybody wants to have their whatever blanket rental kiosk on the beach. So we have limited, uh, first and foremost, just limited space. So there's, there's a, a natural uh, going up against one another to see who, who gets the space. There's competition for the resources that come from the coastal zone, be that fish be that uh, fresh water, what have you. And it's very common that the fact that I do my act, that, that, that doesn't have to be the case. And hopefully with, with good management, we minimize this, but, but left unchecked, just sort of the, the default barrel forward, if you are gonna go do your, uh, I don't know, your 
extreme base extreme army training camp to lose weight for the people in the summertime that's probably going to degrade my restaurant experience because these folks are going to be screaming and doing downward dog and all that kind of stuff and i'm trying to have my whatever hot dogs or whatever you have at the restaurant on the beach right so the very fact that i'm doing my activity makes your activity less valuable The classic example would be an oil spill. So I want to be, if I want to fish right here. These guys want to drill for oil right here. Okay, cool. But if we, if those guys spill their oil, it's bad for them. It's really bad for me, right? My livelihood goes away. Then we have the whole idea of, we'll get to this when we start talking about coastal zone management, which is why coastal zone management was was invented or the, or the terminology first came into play, which is we ha just like we have so many different potential users of the resource, we have many, we have a potential alphabet soup of the regulatory agencies that are governing it. We have the county, we have the city, we have the naval base, we have the port authority, we have the this and the that and the this and the that, right? And the port guys are going to do everything they can. Their charge is to make the port better, right? The, the, the naval base guys are trying to make their naval base as good a naval base as they can. And so that gets difficult, right? That gets very difficult when these guys, when, when they try to play one upsmanship, right? Well, I, I know I'm the county, so I say what goes. And the other guys, no, we're the city, we're the people, you know, and, and, it, and it, it, it is a very challenging thing. I mean, a classic example of this would be, um, would be uh, our very own uh, Channel Islands. The water area no, uh, is, is run by NOAA, the National Marine Sanctuary. The land area is run by the Park Service. Let's just say there's some... Uh, uh, they both say that they're in charge of the, <laughs> of the, of the nearshore environment, right? And they're both federal agencies, right? So it kind of depends on, on the time of day, on, on who's in power and all that kind of stuff. But, but it's, 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 a non, it's a very much so a non-trivial question. The naval base, what do we have there? At, at Magoo, we have, we have tons of endangered birds. U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service regulates or, or, or deals with the management of our endangered snowy plovers, least terns. The DOD decides what happens on the, DO, uh, on the military base, right? They generally work fairly well together, right? But when push comes to shove, if North Korea shoots a missile over here, uh, I don't think the DOD is going to be too worried about the snowy plover uh, fences or what have you, right? So again, that, that conf conflicting thing among agencies. And then ultimately, this gets to, like we mentioned before, this notion of conflicting values. What are we trying to do? The Department of Defense would say, we're here to secure our freedom. We're here to make sure that no bad guys invade us. We need to train. We need to do stuff that might have an adverse impact on this particular resource. But you know, we'll try not to step on the eggs, but we got to train, right? Fish and Wildlife Service, I don't mean to say they don't care about the safety of the country, but you know they're like, dude, what's up with the birds? You're hurting the birds, right? And so, as with so many of these of these issues, conflict resolution, managing conflict is a huge deal. Is a huge deal. Um, we'll have more to say about that as we go on. Cool.